This scenario focuses on understanding event analysis, systems thinking, and human factors in the context of ectopic pregnancy. Most event analysis meetings are initiated after an event, hazard, accident, or incident takes place in an institution. Event analysis meetings are often referred to as root cause analysis, or RCA meetings. You will begin this scenario by first seeing what an event analysis meeting looks like. Now that you have seen what an event analysis meeting looks like, you will learn about identifying systemic vulnerabilities using a systems thinking approach. Whenever we look at serious adverse events or any event that takes place within the healthcare setting, it's important that we approach the problem from a systemic perspective. By that we mean that it is important to focus on all elements of a given system and understand how their design impacts human performance and interacts with human behavior. We can use James Reason's Swiss cheese model of accident causation to understand how a system functions. The model contends that every system has barriers or layers of defense that protect it from threats. In this case, you can think of each barrier as a piece of Swiss cheese. The holes in each of the slices represent weaknesses in individual parts of the system and are continually varying in size and position across the slices. Accidents and incidents occur when a hole in each slice momentarily aligns permitting several failures. We will spend a few minutes walking through each of the four layers of defense described in this model. The first layer is referred to as the unsafe acts layer. This layer is made up of active failures that directly result in an accident or incident. Active failures consist of errors and violations. Errors are honest mistakes that we are all susceptible to. Errors can involve forgetting, misinterpreting, or misjudging information. Violations, on the other hand, are the willful disregard for the rules and regulations. Violations can involve working around established rules, skipping mandated steps, disabling alarms, or removing safety guards. The next layer involves preconditions for unsafe acts. This layer and the rest of the layers in the Swiss cheese model involve latent failures that can contribute to an accident or incident over time. Preconditions for unsafe acts involve conditions that can directly affect human performance. Individual factors impact personnel. They can consist of mental or physical fatigue, illness, or distraction. Situational factors involve failures that occur in the environment. This includes faulty or poorly designed technology, inadequate space, and cluttered or disorganized environments. Team factors involve instances where team members fail to coordinate and communicate effectively. Supervisory factors, the third tier of the Swiss cheese model, focuses on actions and decisions at the supervisory level of an organization that can adversely affect performance and or the overall safety and efficiency of a system. Issues at this tier can involve poor supervision, like inadequate training, planned and appropriate operations, such as inadequate staffing or improper workload requirements, failure to correct known problems, like failures to correct inappropriate behavior or resolve staff conflicts, and supervisory violations, or instructing staff to engage in unsafe practices like cutting corners or falsifying records. Supervisory practices and the conditions and actions of operators are directly impacted by the decisions made by upper-level management. As such, the fourth and final tier of James Reason's model examines the impact of organizational influences on failures in a system. Organizational influences are impacted by the operational process, the resource management, and the organizational culture. There are three causal categories, resource management, organizational climate, and operational process that can be used to better understand issues that occur at this tier. Using your knowledge of systems thinking, now complete the systems thinking worksheet. Now that you have a good understanding of how to identify failures in a system, you can start to identify and develop potential solutions. Next, we will walk through the Human Factors Intervention Matrix, otherwise known as HFIX. HFIX is based on human factors engineering principles and can be used to develop interventions aimed at addressing specific threats or systemic failures identified. HFIX has five categories that center around a given system, environment, task, technology, individual and team, and supervisory and organizational factors. 
HVEX is a tool to help you think about identifying interventions at all layers of a system and facilitates the generation of a greater variety of approaches to attacking a given problem. The first HVEX category focuses on environmental factors and asks individuals to think about how the physical environment can be modified to reduce risk or improve performance. This could involve changing the room or space dimensions, improving lighting, changing the noise level, increasing or decreasing the temperature to make individuals more comfortable, organizing and cleaning the room, changing the way in which individuals stand in a given situation or scenario, and changing the layout or architecture of a given space. The next category refers to the task and asks, how can the task or activity be redesigned to reduce risk or improve performance? Interventions involving the task can focus on the inclusion of memory aids, using checklists, rewriting procedures, changing the pacing or ordering of tasks, reordering task steps, rotating individuals on and off tasks to limit complacency, or increasing the amount of time allowed to complete a task. Next, we can focus on technological factors, which refer to the equipment, tools, software, and documents that are used to perform the job. Essentially, anything that you would use to get your job done can be considered technology. When considering ways of modifying technological factors, ask yourself, can warnings or alarms be used to improve and increase awareness? Can automation be useful in reducing the dependency on human performance of certain tasks? Are there better tools currently on the market? And could equipment be redesigned to make the process safer? Individual and team factors focus on characteristics of the individuals and teams performing work-related activities. Fixes could involve changes to the current recruitment or hiring structure to ensure that only certain types of individuals are hired for a particular position, introducing training or communication protocols, involving pre-briefing or debriefing to ensure that information is communicated effectively, and clearly defining the roles and responsibilities of team members. Finally, when thinking about interventions, it's important that we also try to develop fixes at the supervisory and organizational levels. Here, you want to consider fixes that may involve management, guidance, and oversight of individuals by those in leadership roles. You may want to ask yourself, is there any way that methods could be developed to improve leadership's communication with staff? Could changes be made to better empower supervisors to correct problems or address concerns? Could policies, perhaps related to promotion, sick leave, or overtime be changed to improve safety? And could leadership become more engaged with staff or more aware of safety issues, for instance, engaging in leadership walkarounds? So let's take a moment to walk through an example. Let's say that the issue we are trying to resolve involves an intern having the correct information to prevent an error, but fails to speak up. An environmental intervention may involve repositioning everyone on the team so that the intern is always at the front of the group with the attending so they feel encouraged to speak up. With respect to the task, perhaps you can change the process so that in all non-emergent situations, the attending always turns to the intern and asks them to discuss the next step before moving on. This may empower the intern to release information that they may have been previously holding on to. A technological solution may involve giving all new interns iPad minis so they can reference important information immediately during the case and feel confident in their ability to double check information and speak up. Looking at individual and team factors, you could implement a new training program using simulation to demonstrate the importance of speaking up when an individual knows important information. Finally, you could develop solutions aimed at the organization by creating an incentivization program to reward interns who do speak up on important issues. You could offer each of them a $5 Starbucks gift card every time they speak up on an important issue, for example. Hopefully you can see when using HVIX, it's important to be as creative as possible. No idea is a bad idea when it comes to developing interventions. We'll sort through figuring out which ones are more likely to be successful later. So for now, just be as creative and free thinking as possible. Now that you understand how to develop potential interventions for given systemic failures, let's take a moment to complete the HVEX worksheet. Now that you have a large list of potential interventions, you may be wondering how do you end up selecting the one that will be most likely to succeed. Don't worry, we have another human factors tool we can use called FACES to help us rank our interventions. FACES stands for feasibility, which means can it be done, acceptability, will people accept it, cost-benefit, does the benefit outweigh the cost, effectiveness, will it work, and sustainability, will it last. 
We can use FACES to score each of the interventions we develop on these five factors on a scale from 1, very low, to 5, very high. With respect to feasibility, interventions will score low if they do not currently exist, but they'll score high if they are readily available and easy to implement. Interventions that score high in acceptability will be readily accepted by all individuals who will be impacted by the intervention. With respect to the cost-benefit of a proposed intervention, if the cost outweighs the expected benefit, this would elicit a low score. On the other hand, if the cost is less than expected impact on safety and performance, it will score high. If an intervention will be unlikely to completely eliminate the problem or hazard, it should not score high in effectiveness. Alternatively, if it will very likely eliminate the problem, it will score high. Finally, with respect to sustainability, if an intervention's impact will persist over time with minimal efforts to maintain benefit, it will likely score high. Conversely, if the impact will diminish rapidly after deployment or will require extraordinary effort to maintain, it should score low. FACES becomes most useful when you can use it to compare the scores of different interventions. Let's revisit a couple of the interventions we came up with for the intern who didn't speak up. With our first intervention, Give an intern an iPad mini, the feasibility of this intervention is high, as the iPad mini already exists. With respect to acceptability, this would also score pretty high, as the users, or the interns, would most likely have no problem receiving a free iPad mini. However, when you look at the cost-benefit factor of this intervention, it's likely that the cost will outweigh the benefit of the actual intervention itself. When looking at the effectiveness of this intervention, it's likely that it would be moderate at best. In fact, it's even possible that the new iPad minis would introduce distractions into the scenario and make people even less likely to speak up. Finally, the intervention may not be readily sustainable. Someone will have to purchase new iPads for every intern each year and ensure that this promotes the desired behavior. In total, this intervention received a score of 18. Alone, that doesn't mean much, but when you compare it to another intervention, you can more easily see which ones are likely to satisfy the factors that are most important to you and your organization. If we look at a different intervention, or the idea of creating a simulation training to improve the speak-up behavior, we can see that this intervention scored pretty well in feasibility, as the specific simulation scenario may not fully exist, but should be pretty easy to develop. It scored pretty well in acceptability, as the new interns will likely be okay with participating in a training, but there may be a bit of resistance. It scored high on cost-benefit, as the effect of training is more likely to outweigh the cost of developing the simulation. It scored high in effectiveness, as it will be likely that this type of training will be likely to teach the behavior. And finally, it scored high in sustainability, because once the training is completed, it will be relatively easy to maintain every year. Overall, this intervention received a score of 22, which you can see is better than the original intervention we rated, which received a score of 18. Finally, the last component of this scenario is to evaluate some of the interventions you have developed using the FACES worksheet. As you probably guessed from the example, this rating can be a bit subjective. It's okay to be unsure of how to rate certain factors of your interventions. This can be completed individually or in groups with other people. Once completed, you will have used a systems thinking and human factors approach to identify systemic failures, develop potential interventions, and rank those interventions. Keep in mind that the tools provided in this scenario should be treated as guidelines to help you use a systemic methodology when approaching events and hazards in the future. They are not meant to be restrictive or deter you from using other techniques. They should simply serve as an aid. Best of luck!